before having a solid understanding of what it means to, to have an afterlife, we have to first understand the idea that the Torah, that, that the human being is composed of body and soul. And that a soul is the real us, and that each one of us is one eternal continuum. That is the basic knowledge that we have to first get straight. Now, before elaborating too much on the idea of the soul, it's interesting to think to yourself for a minute about the idea of consciousness. Consciousness itself is very much a scientific enigma. Because human consciousness has actually been referred to in the scientific community as one of the greatest miracles. The fact that we are conscious beings, we are aware, we're aware of ourselves, we're aware of our surroundings. We possess this thing called consciousness. That is considered a miraculous thing, even, even amongst the medical community and scientific community. The truth is, one thing that's kind of interesting to think about is that evolutionary theory holds that only those structures and processes that are significant to aiding in a person's, uh, in, in an entity's survival and its development, only those things are continuing on. What is the value, what's the survival value of this thing called consciousness that we need it, that, that regular neural signals or the physical brain itself wouldn't be able to provide? So there's, there's a you that is aware. Now there's actually a meditation to sort of take this a little bit deeper from the idea of consciousness to the idea of the soul. Because all of us in this room are conscious, right? I hope, right? All of, all of us in this room, all of us in this room are conscious. Now, think about, think about another, another aspect. Let's take a, a dimension deeper. All of us are conscious. All of us are aware. Now, there's a part deeper within us that is aware that we are aware. Right? How do you know that you're aware? Well, there's a deeper part that knows that you're, that is aware that you're aware. And if you meditate on that a little bit further, if you take it to a deeper dimension, there's a part of you that is aware that you're aware that you're aware. And that idea is something that's actually used in Jewish meditation processes of sort of delving into the self of delving deep within, trying to get more in touch with the soul. When a person wants to meditate on the idea, this ethereal concept called a soul, a place to begin, perhaps, is take your awareness and then recognize that there's a part of you that's aware that you're aware, and then a part that's aware that you're aware that you're aware, and so forth. So when describing the soul, we always have to make clear that what we're describing is distinct from our mental capacity. It's not just the, the intellect, okay? And it, the intellect, the, the mental capacity is only one area, one capacity of the overall spirit. There, it's been, it's been uh, discussed even amongst neurobiologists that there is an ethereal mind, that there is this transcendent mind that transcends the brain, which also kind of supports the idea of the soul. As the philosopher of science, Sir Karl Popper, put it, he says, I intend to suggest that the brain is owned by the self, that there is a higher entity, a sense of us, sense of being, sense of I, that becomes manifest in the brain, a person that lives beyond us, the human, the you that lives inside of you. Let's think about the soul for a minute, the concept of the soul. A lot of times we get caught up and think, what is this soul? Is that just something we have to sort of accept on, on blind faith? Let's think about what this idea is. 
So think about yourself for a moment. And in your mind's eye, think just for a moment about yourself looking at yourself in the mirror. Imagine you looking at you in the mirror. But the reflection that's looking back at you, have it not be your current age, have your 15-year-old self looking back at you. You might look a little different. You might have had braces, maybe some pimples. You looked different, perhaps, than you do right now. If you take it back five more years and have your 10-year-old self looking back at you, you'll see, another, again, a different image of you. That image of you might have freckles, might have glasses, might have crooked teeth. Your 15-year-old self, your 10-year-old self, and your current self all look different. Take it back another five years, your five-year-old self looks completely different. If you fast forward at 20 years, the same thing happens. Don't think about that one too hard. <laughs> so the question is, which one of those is the real you? Is it your current self looking back at you? Is it your five-year-old self looking back at you? Is it your 85-year-old self looking back at you? Which one of those is the real me? And if you take it a step further, it gets even more interesting. Because the truth of the matter is that not only do we look differently through the course of our life, but many of the cells that we have in our body are dying and replenishing themselves. So over the course of several years, many of the cells that are in our bodies are actually not the same cells that were there when we were five. From a strictly physical standpoint, in many ways, we are a different us than we were when we were five, not just looks-wise. Now, if you ever do a crime and you don't, you're not caught for a few years and they say, you know, why did you do the crime? Well, it wasn't me. Right? And so the question is, physically speaking, the five-year-old self, the current self, or the 85-year-old self, or the 120-year-old self, which one is the real me? Where am I? How do I know when I look in the mirror that it's even me looking back at me? How do you know if you change that? So then there's the emotional level of ourself. The things that made us happy or sad or excited when we were 15 is different than it was when we were five, I hope. And different than it is now. And maybe different than it's going to be 20 years from now. So physically we're different. We're always changing. Emotionally, we're always changing. Intellectually as well. We think about the world differently when we're five years old as we do in our current self, as we do 20 years from now. So physically constantly changing, emotionally constantly changing, intellectually constantly changing. Every aspect about ourselves is constantly changing. Where is the real me? Where am I? When I say me, who am I even talking about? And so, in Judaism, we would call that place of permanence, we would call that us that lives inside of us, the me inside of me, the one that I can constantly look in the mirror throughout the course of my life and always know that that is me, Despite any external changes, the me inside is called the soul. There's no part or aspect of the physical human being, not a bone, not an organ, not a limb, that can be pinpointed as the true self. So there must be an essential self, an essence, a unifying, animating force, of all the body's capabilities, an ethereal source of our thoughts, of our feelings, of our willpower. Where does it all come from? It's a core of human existence and being. It's, what's make us, it's what makes us, us. And so the soul is the spiritual self. It's the real I that inhabits the body and that operates through it. 
See, a lot of times when we think about soul, we get all confused and we think that's something that you have to accept on faith. No, it's something that really kind of makes sense. So the soul is the enigmatic human that lives behind the human. It's the, it, the person within the person. And the Zohar explains this in a similar way. It says, concerning the creation of the human being, it's written, you've clothed me with skin and with flesh. What then is the human being? Is it merely flat skin and flesh and bones and sinews? No. The essence of the human is the soul. You've clothed me with flesh. In other words, the me is not the flesh. The flesh is the clothing. The skin, the flesh, the bones, the sinews are only a superficial covering like garments. They are not the person. They are not the being. So logically, only a non-physical, non-corporeal entity would be able to comprehend, to be able to appreciate refined and spiritual concepts. There's no part of the physical human being that should be able to grasp non-material concepts that are behind things like art, and music, philosophy. When you get pleasure from music, where does that come from? What part of you is enjoying that? Many people are profoundly moved by music. Right? This is just one example. They're not moved by art. They're moved by a lot of different things. Let's take music as an example. A lot of people are very moved by music and hearing a certain song. Like you hear that song and all of a sudden you're like, oh, you're like in the, in the zone, right? Sari knows what I'm talking about. So where does this deep connection, where does this deep reaction come from? What part of you is experiencing this pleasure? Where do the tears of joy come from or the feelings of inspiration? Where are they generated from? From a combination of different chords? You put some notes on a page and all of a sudden the person's ready to like, you know, fly to the sky? How does that work? So Judaism actually explains that music is one expression of the soul. And listening to music can have a strong impact on the soul as well, on the person as well. So when you play music, that's described as um, expressing dormant areas of your own personality. The own thing that makes you you is expressed if you were write music or play music. Music's the tool that can lift one's spirits, it can generate and enhance our joy, it can help a person overcome temptations, it can bolster our intelligence. How? How do notes on a page do that? The therapeutic value of music is known in scientific journals. Many therapists will listen to music with a client and then talk about the feelings and memories that this song evokes. How do notes on a page do this? What is feeling that? What is experiencing that? So the refined appreciation that's experienced from music reaches a deeper place than the biological aspect of the person. So music is one expression of a pleasure that comes from the soul. It's a soul pleasure. There's no physical part of you that enjoys music, that reminds you of memories, that makes you feel a certain way. Additionally, there are other pleasures that we have that are more refined pleasures. People feel good when they overcome a desire to do something wrong. If you're inclined to do something wrong and then you decide, you know what, I'm going to do the right thing, you feel good. Where does that sense of pleasure come from? What physical bone or organ can you point to that makes you feel good? When we do kindness for another person, Right? There's also pleasure that comes from intellectual discovery. We learn something new. It's like, ah, oh, that feels good. I mean, there's a split second, this, that eureka moment, that you experience a, like a, a euphoria. 
You feel good. Where's that pleasure coming from? What biological element? And so these pleasures transcend the fluctuating super, uh, superficiality that is the material world. These are things that are enjoyed solely by the spirit. So these non-physical experiences that we have and these pleasures that we can experience attest to the fact that there's a non-physical entity that seeks them, that we all possess a soul. Throughout human life, throughout all of our lives, there's a search for meaning that goes on. We're, we're constantly looking for things, searching out things that go well beyond our physical makeup, that go well beyond the, the transient, the temporary existence that we live in. We have a thirst for enlightenment. We have a thirst for meaning. And those thirsts are hardly ever quenched. Viktor Frankl once said that in the, in the healthy human being, there's a will to meaning that sets the human apart from animals. A person would never hear an animal say to themselves, does life have meaning? Animals don't ask that question. Right? How can the human being need transcendence, need something more than the physical world has to offer it? How can there be a thirst with nothing there to quench it? These are not material desires. Right? When a person's hungry, there's something to, to satisfy that hunger. When someone's thirsty, there's something there to satisfy that thirst. When we have an inner need, a biological need, there's a physical thing in the outside world that can quench it. But when we have a desire for meaning, when we have a desire to transcend what in the material world is going to quench that thirst? What is going to quench that desire? There must be something out there in the non-material realm that can satisfy, that can make us feel complete, satisfy that sense of meaning in our lives. When an animal biological function is done, it moves on with its life. Rabbi Tversky, Dr. Tversky, famous psychiatrist, asks a question. He's, he, has this, he specializes in addiction recovery. And he says, why is it that addiction is unique to human beings? Why? He says, you, know, you don't find animals addicted to things. He says that animals, excuse me, he says that addiction is ultimately born out of human discontent. And ultimately, it's due to a lack of spirituality. The person wants something deep within themselves. They want, they're yearning after something, something that the physical world can't satisfy, something that the physical world can't quench. And it tries to satisfy that discontent, that void, that yearning with all sorts of physical things. It eats too much. It drinks too much. It tries to fill a void that it's looking for with physical things. And when that void it can't be filled because you can't fill a spiritual void with physical things, it wants more and it wants more and it wants more. It's a, a desperate attempt to try and satisfy a spiritual desire. So it wants to indulge more and indulge more and indulge more in a futile attempt to feel better. The only true solution is to treat the spiritual void that it is. And until the addiction is really dealt with on this level, satisfying it in a spiritual way, in fact, the 12-step program is very spiritual in orientation, when, unless it's dealt with on that level, a person will never gain a sense of sobriety. So the Madrash, very interestingly, gives an example of what it's like, what's, what's the relationship between the body and soul. And it says, the relationship between body and soul is like a princess that marries a caveman. The princess is the soul, the caveman is the body. Imagine, imagine the princess and, and a caveman get, get together, right? So we'll call the caveman Wog. That's a very caveman-y name. All right, Wog the caveman, 
to princess, think of a princess name, right? Queen Esther, Princess Esther. So the first night that they're together, the princess realizes, oh my gosh, what in the world did I do, right? The caveman takes it back to the cave. So the princess is like, oh my gosh, what did I do? I married this caveman. And she starts crying. And she starts crying and crying. And the caveman, he doesn't know what to do. He's the princess crying. He wants to make her happy. So he does naturally what's ever going to make him happy. He goes out and he clubs a rabbit, right? Brings back the rabbit, dead rabbit. And now, the, now what happens? The princess is even more upset because it's like, huh, that's what you're bringing me back to satisfy me? And so the, the caveman, he doesn't understand. He, he says, oh, if you're not satisfied with that, okay, so I'm going to go club you a, a, a horse. Right? He goes out, he clubs the horse, brings the horse back, and the, the, the princess gets even more upset, and she's more distraught. And he keeps trying to bring back things and items. Look, look, shiny rock. Me bring you back shiny rock. Right? No, she doesn't want that. Right, not that. Right. So, so he keeps trying and bringing in dead animal after dead animal after stick after thing. Oh, me build you fire. Me build you all, all these different things. And each thing just makes the princess more upset. This is the relationship between body and soul that we go through throughout the course of our life. The body is very impressed by food. The body is impressed by money. The body is impressed by fancy clothing. Yet the soul is only concerned with the things that really matter. Right? Remember, we said the soul is that place of permanence within us. The only thing the soul wants are things of permanence. And you know what? There's only one source of permanence in the world. And those are things that are outside of the world, things in the spiritual realms, right? God. So the soul wants God. The soul wants the spiritual. The soul wants the transcendent pursuits that it remembers back in the palace. And every time the body tries to satisfy that, with another food, another car, another, you know, another brand name shoes or whatever it is, right? The soul is just that more frustrated and disappointed. And so you can have people in this world, many people in this world, who have all the physical pleasures that money could buy, who have the greatest parties and the greatest foods and the greatest cars and the biggest houses, and yet feel completely empty and dissatisfied in their life. Because that princess inside, the soul inside, desperately wants something else, is looking for something else. The soul's immortality. So that's the soul. That's what we all have. Now, the soul is immortal. It lives forever. It's always here. It was, it was, it was in existence before it came into our bodies that occupy ourselves now. And it will continue existing long after our body is no more. And the soul's immortality almost seems logical from, from our own human experience. You know, there's this book, best-selling books, published, I think, the last 10 years or so, Tuesdays with Maury. Where in the book, Maury is a sociology professor who's nearing his end. He's, he's coming up towards the end of his life. Um, and it says in the book that, Maury says, everyone knows that they're going to die, but nobody believes it. In other words, we kind of live, we don't really live as if we are going to die. So there seems to be a part of the human system, a part of our own being, right, coming from some sort of subliminal whisper within that confidently lives life as though it's going to last forever. This idea itself attests to the soul's existence, right? And the fact that it's immortal. Because this state of mind is ingrained, right? This outlook is inseparable. It's inseparable from the, the, the human experience. All of us live as if we're going to live forever. Really, the beginning of our life is just a, is just a countdown clock. We don't live like that, though. There's an interesting idea, similar idea, brought by... Dr. Jacob Glenn, he writes something interesting. He says that medical science has long noticed the irrefutable fact that the existence, that there's an existence of an inexplicable phenomenon that could only be described 
as a spiritual resistance to ravaging disease or diseases like cancer and heart failure. An afflicted individual continues to live his purposeful life for extended periods of time despite gloomy predictions uh, for his you know, pending, pending end. And so, again, there's this sort of divine whisper within that makes us continue living as if our life was going to continue forever. And the concept also of an afterlife is, is sort of is easy to relate to based on our human experience. And I talk to a lot of people who say, well, like the afterlife is something that we kind of have to just accept on faith. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Because we have clues, even in our own world, that, that, that our reality exists in the form of certain cycles. So, for example, someone who never saw the sowing of plants before, they never saw a seed be, I never saw a seed planted before. So, would you think to yourself, you never saw a seed planted before, would you believe that after you bury the seed, and the seed begins to rot, that just then, only then, right, the seed rots, it disappears, that a tree that's blossoming with flowers and fruits 10,000-fold times greater than the actual seed that was planted is going to start? That the real reality of the seed, the real experience, the real potential of the seed is going to only be experienced after it's placed in the ground and it deteriorates? I grew up in Florida. Um, don't hold it against me. Um, and when I, when I was 17, so I went to yeshiva. I went, I went away to school um, up north. And I remember the first weekend being there. It was in the winter. And saw the very first, for me, the first time saw, I saw snow. Right? 17 years old. Only a Floridian can say that. So looking out the window, I mean, it was bleak. You look outside, and there was, a, there was a forest. But the forest looked very much, right, a snow-covered a snow forest where the sky is gray, and the leaves, right, are, have, been, have long, are long gone. It looks bleak. It looks like death. Would it occur to someone like me from Florida, not knowing any better, not knowing, not knowing that, there's a, that there's a season and, that, and the seasons are constantly turning, would it occur to me that shortly after this, right, just a few months later, the, these trees were going to be budding anew as they were when they first grew, as they were in their youth? There's going to be new flowers and new leaves that come from it. It's going to look brand new. If I didn't know any better, if I just saw the year and the now of the, of the winter season, I'd think, oh, my God. You know, I, I'm in doom's land. So the idea of a cycle, the idea of a continuation, despite the fact that in the here and the now there appears to be a, a death or there appears to be, you know, the deterioration of the seed, we're given the clue that that does not point to the end, that there's a continuation that goes on. Thermodynamics is the science of energy conversion involving heat and other, other forms of energy. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes form. No matter what you do to it, you crush it, you grind it, you burn it, you can't obliterate anything. You can't destroy anything in its entirety. Now let's use that same logic, that same idea with a soul, the idea of a soul. There's something that we've identified tonight called a soul, right? Something that animates you. There's something that makes, there's some sort of energy force that makes the distinction, makes a difference between a living body and a non-living body, right? Five minutes before a person's passing, there's something there enlivening them that is not there afterwards. So whatever you want to call that energy inside, we call it a soul, but whatever you want to refer to that as, 
that energy's got to go somewhere, right? Energy's not created or destroyed. It just changes form. So now it's not occupying the body anymore, but it's got to go somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. You know, many Jews think that Jews don't believe in an afterlife. They say, well, you know, the Christians, they believe in an afterlife. I envy my non-Jewish friends because they at least believe in an afterlife. I'm like, yo, buddy, you know, where do you think they got it from, by the way? You know? <laughs> so a lot of Jews don't think that Jews believe in an afterlife. And the question is why? Why is that? So there's a few reasons why. Why do Jews think that Jews don't believe in the afterlife? A few reasons why. Number one, because in Judaism, eventually everyone makes the cut. And, you know, sometimes some people it takes longer. Some people it might take multiple incarnations to kind of get it right. Um, some people, their purification process and the afterlife, which we'll talk about next week and the following weeks, some takes longer than others, and some have to undergo different things than others. But eventually, eventually, at the end of the day, everyone kind of makes the cut. So we're not, the focus is not so much on, ooh, how do we get to heaven? How am I going to, you know, what do I got to do? Because at the end of the day, it's not our preoccupation. Judaism also, and this is probably the main reason why, the value on this world is stressed. The Judaism is the, is the focus of Judaism is the value of this world and its challenges. Right? What, what it says in Perke Yavos, it says in the Ethics of Our Fathers, that one hour of good deeds and repentance in this world is better than the entirety of the world to come. So just a few moments of good deeds in this world, stressing that this world is the important world, is better than all the life of the world to come. Why? Why is that? Why is one, one good deed in this world or one act of repentance in this world better than all the life of the world to come as far as actual value? The Rebbe Rashab, the, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, says a very interesting idea on this Mishnah. He says that in this world, that's where man or mankind have the ability to cause their creator delight. This world, by doing the right thing, is where we give God pleasure. That's better than the world to come. Why? Because that's where mankind gets the delight. We get pleasured from God in reward for the, the, the deeds that we did. So in other words, in this world, in, in our world, our physical world, this is where we give God pleasure. It's about God. This world is the world that's about God. By us doing the right thing, we give God pleasure. In the next world, it's about us getting pleasure. It's kind of selfish. The next world is all about us getting the pleasure of, of the reward that we're reaping from the good deeds that we did in this world. So since this world is about giving God pleasure, and our main occupation, our main direction in Judaism is giving God pleasure, connecting with God, being about God, our preoccupation, our focus is on this world, not the next world. The next world, yeah, we reap the benefits, but our focus is on this world. That's why we're here. Other faiths try to bring people into heaven. Judaism tries to bring heaven into people. So the soul wants to connect with God. And based on how well the soul connects with God during this lifetime will be the afterlife that it enjoys. So the soul, each of us, each one of our souls, we have a prescription. The same way that a doctor can examine two patients and determine, uh, you need this medicine and you need this type of medicine. And meanwhile, they both look like they have the same ailments. The doctor, he gets all your records, he sees your whole, you know, all your blood, your blood results, and, you know, he gives you a full examination. He says, okay, you need this medication and you need this medication. But, well, we both have a headache. 
no, 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 no. Things aren't always what they seem, right? So the doctor, knowing you, your inner workings, knows exactly what you need to give you your proper prescription. The same thing works with God. God is our doctor. God knows exactly what we need in order to be a spiritually healthy individual. So Judaism teaches that Torah is the Jewish person's prescription for life. You want to know what to do? You want to know how to have a spiritually healthy life? Follow the And in fact, in the Torah, there are 613 commandments. 248 of those are positive instructions, thou shalt. 365 of those are prohibitions, things to avoid, right? Thou shalt not. And these correspond with the 248 bones of the body and the 365 tendons and sinews. Sinews. Right? So, so in other words, the skeletal system and the circulatory system have, spiritually speaking, the same amount of parts as the amount of commandments. So when we fulfill the commandments, spiritually speaking, we are a fully healthy human. Now, the means by which the soul experiences the good that God created for it in the world to come, in the, in the heavens, in the afterlife, is through fulfilling the commandments. The more we connect with God, the, mean, the commandments are a means of connecting with God. It's a means of ga gaining spiritual health, of having a, having a perception of, of godliness. If, if the next world, think about it like this, if the afterlife is all about experiencing God, if a person is not enjoying God in this world, what benefit is the afterlife going to be for them? In other words, if you were invited to a concert, but you don't like the music, you're not going to really enjoy yourself, right? I don't know if you're an opera fan or not, right? I, I, I'm not saying opera fan. It's, it's good. Those like, some like it, some don't like it. If you were invited to the opera, if you're given free front row tickets to the opera, but you don't like the opera, that's going to be a really painful experience. And we're going to get into this a little bit more next week when we talk about the stages and pro progression of the soul in the afterlife. But the afterlife is really an experience of God. And depending on how we live our life in this world will depend on how we experience God. If a person really likes the opera, if they're really into God, then experiencing God is going to be a really enjoyable experience. If a person doesn't enjoy the opera, then even the front row seats right at the opera is gonna be it's the same opera one guy sitting there is like this is the greatest thing in the world i felt like i won the lottery the next guy next is like this is a nightmare when's it going to end right not even speaking english it's like it's what is this who likes this garbage so you can you can be experiencing the same thing and to one it's enjoyable and to the other one this is this, this is terrible it's the same thing. If a person is activating their soul in this world and engaging in the commandments, connecting themselves to God, then when their soul is free of the body, that experience of God is going to be something very enjoyable. The same person, though, in the body who's not engaged in godly things, is instead occupied in how much money they're going to get and how much food they're going to get and how much pleasure they're going to get, what vacation is they, are they going on next? How many cars are they going to drive? How big is their house? All the things that other people go after. So experiencing God is going to be like, oh my gosh, this is so boring. This is terrible. So the soul is rewarded and punished in the afterlife. Not like as a punitive, but the way that you're going to experience it is basically how you make yourself. So the, each person, right, collectively, as Jewish people, we fulfill the, the 613 commandments, right? There are certain commandments, and, and then for, for, for those who are not Jewish, if they fulfill the seven laws of Noah, they too have this divine connection because that's their prescription, right? Two people, they look the same on the outside, right? Everything looks the same, right? 
The inside's different, not better or worse, just they're different individuals. They have different roles, different purposes in creation. So for a Jew, we need to stick with the 613 commandments of the Torah, and that's how we gain connection with God. And for a non-Jewish person, they follow the seven laws of Noah, they have a connection with God. And everyone lives happily ever after. And the world is a beautiful place. Sounds easy, right? So all the people of the world are charged with this divine purpose, living up to their soul's potential. It's in different ways, two different prescriptions. But nonetheless, this is what we're here for. So this is all done by choosing the godly path and minimizing the influence at the base and our base self-concerns, uh, you know, uh, bodily desires. You know, in Judaism, in Judaism we say that if you don't know what you're willing to die for, then you haven't begun to live. You know, the fulfillment of the soul means the optimum realization of its potential. If we don't have meaning in our lives, if we, don't, if we aren't connected with some core underlying purpose, then all the physical enjoyments, all the beautiful vacations, and even the wonderful spouse and children and everything that we have can make a person feel like they're missing something. You know, the secret of life in this world and then by extension achievement in the afterlife is our closeness with God. Every mitzvah that we do makes us a little bit closer to God. In fact, the word mitzvah we've learned means not only commandment, it means connection. Every time we do a mitzvah, we're further connected with God. We're brought closer with God. Think about it for a second. When we, in the physical world, talk about closeness, we talk about clo how close are you to something, right? We talk about physical proximity, right? The chair right, is close to the table. We mean that it's, you know, only a foot away. Whenever we're talking about things in the physical world, we talk close and far determined by physically how, what's the distance between them. The mountain is close to the river, right? That means that it's not that far. In physical, in, in physical terms, that works. Whenever you want to determine something physical, closeness, closeness and farness are determined by physical proximity. Now, a question. In spiritual terms, in spiritual terms, how does one determine closeness? We say we want to be closer to God. And if you haven't been paying attention until now, just, just pay attention these next three minutes as we kind of tie all this idea together. Physical things are deemed close or far by their physical proximity. The chair is close to the table. It means that the chair is near the table, physically. What about spiritual closeness? You want to be close with God. Or even close with another person. Let's talk about closeness with God first. You want to be close with God. We always talk about being close with God. And how doing a mitzvah is connecting oneself to God. Where's the connection? God's not physical. Where am I, con where's, where, how, what does that mean? It's not physical connection. God is not physical. The connection that's being forged is not physical. What are we talking about this connection over here? What do we mean we're developing a closeness through the mitzvahs? What does that mean? In fact, in Devarim, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verse 5, it says, you shall bind yourself to him. You shall bind yourself to God. What does it mean, bind yourself to God? Cleave to God. Become close with God. What in the world does that mean? God's not physical. If you go a certain amount of light years, you don't reach God. So the Talmud asks this question. The Talmud asks the question, how does one achieve closeness to God? How does one achieve closeness 
in the spiritual realms. The way a person attains closeness to God or closeness to anything spiritual, what does closeness mean in the spiritual realms? Closeness to God means imitating his attributes. Imitation. God displays kindness. When we display kindness, we share a spiritual closeness with God. When we become a, an expression of God's will through doing the commandments, we become connected with God. So in the spiritual realm, so again, physical world, closeness means physical proximity. In the spiritual realms, closeness means resemblance. You resemble God. You do what God does, what God instructs, what God wants. And it's an important thing to remember in relationships as well. If you want to be close to another person, not that you have to be like them, but closeness to another person means that you, you have things that you share. The more things you share, you tend to be closer to the person. Right? You can have two friends or two people that are very distant physically from each other, but still very close because they share a perspective. They share a unifying force. There's a resemblance in the two of them. There's an emulation in, in, into them. And the truth is that the same thing applies with those, of, those loved ones that we've lost. Those souls that continue to live on in the spiritual realm, if a person wants to gain further closeness with them, one way to do that, emulation. Emulate them. Be like them. Be what they represented. Embody that. It's, it works in a similar way with God, right? When we want to achieve closeness with God, we emulate what God wants from us. When we want to have a closeness with a loved one who has passed, someone whose soul continues on, when we want, again, because on a soul level, we can still relate, we can still have closeness. How is that closeness achieved? Closeness in the spiritual world is achieved through emulation. When we emulate that person's message, their worldview, their perspective, their good deeds, when we do something good in their stead, there's a closeness that is aroused. You know, next week, next week we're going to talk, uh, we're going to go through the stages of the afterlife, how the soul ascends, and we're also going to talk about specific ways in which a person can stay connected with a loved one who has gone into the, into, the, into the afterlife. So we're going to cover a lot of ground next week. There's very, there's a lot of good, juicy stuff. So I hope that everyone will uh, follow us again, come back again. But just to leave off on this one point, when it comes to God and when it comes to life in this world, we have to remember the afterlife is a reflection of the life that we live. All of our lives are meant to be Pursuing. Again, that doesn't mean that you can't have good food and you can't enjoy other things, right? Things of the physical world. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy those things. But what's your preoccupation? Where's the nucleus of your life? Where's the focus of your life? If the focus of your life is on the next burger and on the next house and car, and the, then again, the person's going to walk away empty. This life is going to feel empty, and the next life is going to feel empty. Because a person who doesn't enjoy the opera is not going to enjoy front row seats. And so as we live our lives and we think about the afterlife, the question that we always have to ask ourselves, not first, now the, the one that we like to ask, is there life after death? The first question we have to ask is, is there life before death? What am I living with? Because my afterlife is a reflection of the life that I live. What am I living with? Is the fact that I'm living today or that I'm alive today, is that only because I happened to wake up, because I happened to not be hit by a bus, right? Or am I living with something? Do I, 
do I have a reason? Do I have purpose, meaning, something, a zest that I'm working for, living for, yearning for? If that's the preoccupation of this life, our afterlife experience is going to be very pleasant as well. Thank you.